Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate it. I hope the week's gone well. They fly by. Um, I attended the first half earnings release from East African Breweries today. Uh, details are in, later on in the podcast and also on the website. Um, I did an interview this afternoon with Charles, who I'm particularly fond of. He's a neighbour. He's always complaining about my age. Whenever I see an unruly hedge, my hedge unruly, I says, I should please get that hedge cut. Um, but great speaking with him about business, very confident. Um, and uh, we'll publish that interview early next week. I'll put up a photograph of a selfie I took with him after our interview. And I'll also put up a picture of uh, where the earnings release actually happened in the Serena Hotel, the entrance. Um, I think the dollar sell-off is a head fake. Home thoughts went back to Robert Frank, and probably one of my favourite photographs, uh, which was described like this by Jack Kerouac in his introduction to the Americans. Kerouac describes this photograph we're now looking at as a long shot of night road, arrowing forlorn into immensities and flat of impossible to believe. America in New Mexico under the prisoner's moon. Kerouac, with one of his seminal books, well, the seminal book on the road, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. There was nowhere, nowhere to go but everywhere, so just keep on rolling under the stars. The air was soft, the stars so fine, the promise of every cobbled alley so great that I thought I was in a dream. What is that feeling when you're driving away from people and they recede on the plane till you see their specks dispersing? It's the too huge world vaulting us and it's goodbye, but we lean forward to the next crazy venture beneath the skies. I wrote a piece on the 7th of January called On the Road, that was 2013. My Christmas holiday ritual is to jump into a car and take the family down to the coast. The Nairobi Mombasa Road arrows into immensities and is impossible to believe. It retains me a mystical hold on my imagination. It connects me to my childhood and beyond. Um, political reflections. Putin, we have managed to agree on the main issues, adding that a ceasefire would come into effect on February the 15th. Interesting piece in global research. Kiev's bloody war is backfiring. Poroshenko's military mobilization is due not only to numerous setbacks in the east. Ukrainian troops are being pushed back on all fronts by highly motivated rebels defending their own towns and villages, but also because thousands are deserting, throwing down their arms and fleeing to Russia. In response, the Ukrainian parliament has passed a law authorizing local commanders to shoot deserters on the spot. I concluded by saying, you know, the geopolitical grandmaster Vladimir Putin has shown the 21st century oil war specialist Barack Obama that he could play hardball at the ground level. I put up a photograph of Obama and Putin at APEC. And then this is an important point, I think, made by Bloomberg. Putin's high tolerance for pain and Europe's reluctance to inflict it. Former Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili, whose country was invaded by Russia in 2008, and interestingly, Lavrov used him as an example and said, look at him, what happened? And he's saying, no better option is going to happen for Poroshenko. Revealed in a, to an audience of Ukrainians what Vladimir Putin thought of their nation. I had 36 meetings with Putin, Saakashvili said in a visit to the Ukrainian city 
of Lviv in August, five months after the annexation of Crimea. And almost each one who repeated that Ukraine is not a real state but Russian territory, he will go as far as he is allowed. Dmitry Trenin says Putin has much more at stake. Putin's will and Russia's willingness to suffer for a cause is his asset. Fortune magazine tweeted Eurozone Greece still deadlocked despite killer fascist state fashion statements. One was Christine Lagarde, the other was the Greek finance minister's pretty arresting photograph. I put up a photograph of Saudi Arabia's deputy crown prince Mohammed bin Nayef arriving with his uncle King Salman to greet President Obama. Digital dark age could leave historians with no records of the 21st century. This report of the independent. Euro 114, 20 area dollar index uh, has fallen this morning to 94. Japanese yen strength of 118.74, Swiss E.9280. Pound topped 154 in a very big move yesterday. Aussie 0.7776, India rupee 60.02095, South Korean 1098.05, Real 282.06, Egyptian pound 762, South African rand 1173.17. Dollar index, I think this is a buying opportunity. Soft January retail sales out of the US, but I think on balance, uh, I stick with my king dollar story. Euro dollar. Big bounce above 114 yesterday, but I think we're going to fall back below today. Gold, 1230.135. Crude oil, very big move. I'll put up a one month chart, 51.86. It's all over the shop. The moves are simply unprecedented. Coming to Sub Saharan Africa, that you can simply declare a mineral strategic at a minister's discretion is a worrying proposition to the mining company. Exactly. It's, look, government is sovereign and can enact what it likes, but the point is investors vote with their feet. They decide, are we going to invest here or in Mozambique or Namibia? That you can simply declare a mineral strategic at a minister's discretion is a worrying proposition to the mining companies. South Africa's parliament descended into chaos as Zuma got a hostile reception. Members of Julius Malema's EFF, Economic Freedom Fighters, clash with security officials in this photograph after being ordered out of the chamber during President Zuma's State of the Nation address in Parliament in Cape Town, February 12, 2015. Zuma had barely begun speaking when EFF members began interrupting, demanding to ask the President about when he would repay part of a $23 million state-funded security upgrade of his rural home. Clearly angry speaker Belaka Mabete warned several EFF members to sit down before ordering they be removed by security officers, prompting a brief brawl in which several people were injured. We have seen that we are part of a police state Malema, whose t-shirt was torn and a fracas, told reporters, after being bundled out of parliament in a scrum. South African all show, meanwhile, has opened 2015 with a blistering start, up 6.09% year-to-date and at a record. Dollar rand, not the same, 1173.17 when I checked last Egyptian pound, 762.72, uh, 72 Egyptian stock market, EGX30, up 9.23% year-to-date, third best in the world, best in Africa. Nigeria all show, meanwhile, down 19.39%. And the worst performing index in the world. Nigeria's central bank chief said on Thursday there was no need to panic about a slide in the currency. Whenever they say that, there's every reason to panic. Central bank chief said on Thursday there was no need to panic. After figures showed the bank had been burning through more than $110 million a day in a vain attempt to defend it. Foreign reserves fell to $33.4 billion as of February the 10th a drop of a billion dollars over the previous 12 days. Um, I said this on the 19th of November. I said the currency heads to 200. It's going over that now. The central bank does not have the firepower. Um, and that remains the point and the fact. Um, and I said on January the 15th, the M.A. Feelys, um, okay, the finger of the dike strategy is about to be overwhelmed by a tsunami. Well, it is now. 
As you can see, Nigeria's Naira was down nine days in a row, the longest losing streak since the Russian crisis in August 1998. I saw this tweet. Dear Noe Wheeler, in one month the Naira has lost 35 Naira to the pound. Any explanations? Well, we know what the explanations are, and we could see this coming. Ghana stock exchange is minus 4.93% year to date. East African breweries reported half year results. Profit after tax up 11.079%. Revenue up 9.1342%. That was good. Cost of sales up 9.487%. Selling and distribution costs up 4.6275%. So keeping it below the turnover number. Uh, admin expenses down 2.4406%. Net finite costs up 13.72%. Uh, profit after tax up 11.079%. Dividend unchanged, a shilling 50. Borrowings up 5.5 billion shillings. I went to the earnings release before I did the interview. Kenya remains the big revenue piece for uh, EABL, 61% or thereabouts. But Tanzania was strong. Premium spirits, look at this, 32% up. Reserve spirits up 67%. That's the really expensive whiskey. Senator, and it was interesting to read the body language. I think they'd invested a lot in it, disappointed with the way the government reacted, <coughs> upset about the entire ecosystem being left uh, to wither on the vine, but saying that it really is meaningless now to the PL. Saying Senator was created as a replacement for illicits like Changa and Busa. We had 12,000 outlets, they now have 8,200. Premium beer was strong in Kenya because of Guinness. That was a real standout performer. Uganda, Waragi volumes up 32%. Tanzania first half up 17% strong. EABLI, which is predominantly at the moment South Sudan, up 110%. Uh, 118%, very strong performance in South Sudan, constrained by unavailability of dollars, however. Spirits plus 35% first half, that's big. Tusker Lager flat on the year. Uh, I thought the results beat the street estimates. Revenue expansion of 9.1342% was commendable. We'll get juiced in 2015 by the oil price stimulus, which I asked Charles about in the interview. Interesting point he made. They have bounced Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Kenya was soft. South Sudan stood out. Spirits are gaining traction. So uh, I thought these were better than the market would have expected, and therefore these will be well received. Falling crude price hits exploration prospects for East Africa. Launching a university course to trade future oil executives looks bold given the crash in global crude prices, but Kenya is not counting itself out of the energy race yet. Bust cycles are the time to prepare the industry backbone, says Sumaya Hassan Athmani, chief executive of the National Oil Corporation which on Tuesday launched a course to run at Nairobi Strathmore University to expand the fairly small pool of oil and gas talent in Kenya. Hopeful investors have built East Africa, the world's most promising frontier for oil and gas exploration for the past 10 years. Good reason for that optimism. 2.3 barrels of recoverable oil have been discovered in Uganda and Kenya. Despite the first oil discovery in East Africa nine years ago, none of it has been commercially developed for export. No infrastructure exists to transport the waxy crude from remote drill sites and regional oil executives are a rare species. Now, before the region has sold a single drop of oil, the collapse in global prices threatens the industry before it has even got going. This is a point I made several times, quite a long time ago. Exporters planning to delay production until prices rise. Kenya's Institute of Economic Affairs warns the country could lose $720 million in annual revenues for every year of delayed output. Tallow Oil, who are the most bullish of operators in this region, has said on Wednesday it would reduce its rig count in Kenya from 4 to 1 this year. Uh, we will gradually wind that three rigs down throughout the year. We've still allocated significant capital to Kenya and plan to continue exploration at a more modest pace, as you'd expect with the oil price. His investor sentiment is down. Smaller guys are starting to look, ask the government for an extension to their work programs because they can't afford to meet them. Um, and this is, as I said, a big blow to regional governments counting on oil windfalls to boost budgets <coughs> and fund multi billion dollar infrastructure projects, including road, rails, and ports. 
with the oil price drop, you're not going to see the pipeline built for a while. The whole infrastructure thing might have to be rethought a little bit. That's what I was saying. I said on the 31st of December, Teller Oil and Africa Oil are hoping for a Hail Mary pass. They're not anymore. They're taking decisions now. Um, dwindling oil fortunes, not good for Kenya. I said that on the 17th of November. My concern at this moment is this. We are necessarily placing a big bet on oil and gas, cementing our position as the pivot, the energy conduit at the root of the sea. Now go take a look at the price of oil. I said then, that was on the 17th of November, there's an outside chance we could break down to $50 a barrel, which we then went and did. The consequential effects on our economy if they can be kicked down the road are not good, not good at all, I'm afraid. What makes Nairobi Africa's most intelligent city has caught everyone's attention. This was a piece on CNN. For a second year in a row, Kenya's busy capital city in Nairobi has been named the most intelligent city in Africa. Um, according to the Intelligent Community Forum, intelligent communities are those that have taken conscious steps to create an economy that can prosper in the broadband economy. Nairobi was the only African city to appear on their short list of 21 hubs throughout the world for 2015. And I wrote about this when I was actually writing in 2012 about a visit to the Mara. We were not going as far as that, only two days' journey in the ox cart to a bit of El Dorado. My father had been fortunate enough to buy in the bar of the Norfolk Hotel from a man wearing an old Etonian tie. So says Alfred Huxley's The Flame Trees of Thika, which is a beautiful and lyrical book. Mount Kenya Safari Club in Nanuki, founded in 1959, became a mecca for the international jet set. The property sits on the slopes of Mount Kenya. I've sat at the bar and half expected William Holden or Adnan Khashoggi to pop in. My most intense memory is discovering a complete film studio on the grounds and walking around in the evening light alone. Mm -hmm. However, this time I was set to visit the Fairmont Mara Safari Club. There are two Africas now, this is relevant to what CNN was saying. The average age in sub Saharan Africa is 20. These folks are all connected surfing the now in a way that is breathtaking. I work not more than 10 minutes walk from the Norfolk. It is urban, highly aspirational, tech savvy. After all, Kenya was the laboratory that gave birth to the mobile money sensation at Pesa. It's a hub. I said the traffic can be frightful, and boy, it's been frightful. It's particularly the mornings, I leave so early. I was leaving at 6.20. I have to leave it now at 6, and it's taking me twice as long. Um, uh, it's on the move. Nairobi has an edginess which can become very intense. Can you shilling 91.547? Nairobi all share close at a record high every day this week. Uh, before today, I don't know what's happened today. Up 5.39% year to date. NSE 20, four, month, four and a half month highs, up 4.33%. EABL was a strong performer naturally after those results. Traded as high as 332. Wishing you a tremendous weekend.